is Yitzchak Raskin. I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. And as a child, I used to always like to draw. I used to doodle in class. Art was uh, something that I enjoyed. One of the most underrepresented ideas in Hasidus is the arts. Choshim. All of Hasidus talks about God. And of course, part of what it does, it tries to give a person techniques and tools to bring God into themselves, to personalize God. And the classic version is the mind-heart version, the koiches, the faculties. What's not often discussed in Hasidus is the five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. And the five senses are connected to the arts. Seeing is the visual arts, hearing is music. When Hasidus talks about the arts, they make the following argument that seeing, for example, or hearing, the chushim, are a shortcut to the soul. I now see the world heading to the next phase where we're going to take the written word and go to the visual medium. And that also is going to, Mir Tashem, be a quicker process, but we need thousands of people to be involved. Every generation made art, but it all got lost. In this generation, we can make art that'll last forever on the digital age, and one piece of art could spread around the whole world in minutes. Because just like we took Teresh Balpeh, it was supposed to be a verbal communication, and it was gonna get lost if we didn't write it down. And Rabbi Huda Nasi went through a project of the Mishnah that followed up with the Talmud, and it was all about writing it down. That was a 300-year process. If you're an artist, and artists see, they don't just draw, they see. If you're a musician, you don't just write music, you hear. You see God, you hear God, these are very direct ways of bringing God to a person to go straight into the soul. But because there's little struggle, because there's little labor, because there's less work, it's less sustained, it doesn't last as long, and it's less transforming. So ideally, you want to combine what the arts give you with some learning, with some meditation. We know that when Mashiach comes, it'll be v'ra'u kol basar yachtav. Everybody will see that it's God's words that speaks. Back in the day, you looked in the book, you knew, but now you want to just see it everywhere. If we want to be in Mashiach, we need to live into what they said Mashiach will look like. And this is one of the ways we do that. The way I see what we do here uh, in VR connect with Hasidus and Kala Art Contest is kind of taking these theoretical ideas or text and converting it into not just artwork, which is two-dimensional, but 3D and even 4D experiences if you take in time and gameplay. It's really increasing the dimensions and making it so immersive and real, as opposed to something distant that you read from arm's length. It really, you immerse and you go into it and you live it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what um, people will come up with and all the different creative ideas. We have to use our talents to serve the Eberstar. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the award ceremony for Hasidus in Color. We want to welcome and their families and friends and supporters. I have to say personally, I walked into this room, I thought I accidentally walked into the Batal Art Gallery. It was so just surrounded in color and beauty, magnitude, both in quantity and quality of what we And I want to say thank you. Sorry? Yeah, I'll hold it here. Okay. Yes. I want to say a big Yashar Kayach to Rabbi Menachem Meltzer for putting it together. <laughs> and it really, it really, the quality, it's really incredible. The thought we'll see as the ceremony goes on that putting your thought involved into the art is exactly how the Chumash refers to art. It's all our thoughts that go into it. It's very exciting. And really, we are all artists. Hashem created the world. He placed them in Gan Eden. And he says, you're here of the work it. What does it mean to work it? The ground grew by itself. The fruit trees, everything blossomed. What did he do? 
He was the artist of the garden. He was the one who says, oh, I want a cherry blossom there. I want to have some violets over there. His whole avaida was to make it beautiful. And God created a world in partnership with us. He gives us the raw material, and we're here to make it a beautiful experience. And you guys, the artists today, are really helping that come into reality. So thank you very, very much. A big shkayach gadol to you and the artists. It's in our name, Chachma Bina Das. The first time it shows up in the Chumash, as far as I understand, the words Chachma Bina Das is when Hashem chooses Betzalel to be his artist. It says that Hashem filled him with the Ruach of Chachma, the Ruach of Bina, and the Ruach of Das, so that he can know all the Malachas, and he should be able to do art. The first time that we are mentioned is in reference to art. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's Hashem's greatest. His chachma is what creates the whole world, so it's all in art, it's all beautiful, and Betzalel was gifted the knowledge of all crafts, and that leads me to introduce our first presenter, who is prolific in many mediums. He is good at the art in painting, there's screens, there's physical structures of metal, menorahs, Overflowing brachas in color, it's fantastic. I want to introduce you all to Rabbi Yitzchak Muli. Yeah. This is for the camera. Apparently we're live online, so we gotta, you ready? Okay, we are. Shalom friends. My name is Rabbi Yitzchak Muli, and I'm truly humbled to be here. I really, really am. And I'm truly humbled to be in a room with all of you, all the creatives and their friends, their families, their supporters. This is incredible. This really is truly incredible. And if I may say, this is revolutionary that any time during the year, especially Erev Pesach, that we have so many people stopping what they're doing, the quote-unquote important things, to come out and celebrate art and creativity in our community. I've been a creative for a little while, but at the same time, I'm self-taught. I'm kind of making it up as I go along. And one thing that I've discovered in my own creation and looking at other people's creations is that there are three basic elements that are involved in, if I may say, all forms of creation. And number one, there is what you say. Number two is how you say it. And number three, how you share it with the world or what you choose to do with it after that. So to break it down a little bit more, what you say is your subject matter. How you say it is your form, your medium, how you express yourself, and then of course, what you do with it afterwards. So there are art schools out there, and they teach how to say. They teach portraiture, oil painting, photography, printmaking, dance, poetry, writing. Those are all how you say it. To master a skill, to master a form of expression, but what we're here to celebrate is not how you say, but more what you say. As Chabad Chassidim, as Yidin, we all have an Ashama, we all have Chassidus, we all have our lived experiences, and at least if I may say so for myself, that's what I express. And so to me, I never went to art school, so I don't, I'm not proficient one form of expression. I'm definitely not locked into any one form of expression. To me, it's about taking the ideas of chassidus and finding a way to communicate it with the world. And sometimes it's through a painting, through canvas. Sometimes it's through a sculpture, through a menorah, through an interactive piece, many different ways of being able to communicate chassidus in color. And that's what we're here tonight, today, to celebrate. All of the incredible entries, really, really incredible entries from so many different people to share and to celebrate chassidus in color. I'm a big Talmud of Rabbi Yossi Paltiel, 
and I understand he is one of the judges. I don't think he's here today right now, but one thing I learned from him is he has an in-depth, many shiurim, he has an in-depth Tanya shir. And he gets to Pere Gimel in his in-depth Tanya shir, and Pere Gimel and Tanya talks about Chachma and Bina. So if I may take you on a journey a little bit, the way I understand the creative process, al we were supposed to have a projector I could show you, I went through this process myself and I want to talk about it in concept and then talk about it in my experience. Chachma is koyach ma. Koyach ma is generally translated as the koyach, the capacity of what? And it's tr said sometimes it's this idea of bria kamavrik, a flash of lightning. But where does that flash come from? What's it all about? What's, where, where, does, where does it all come from? So the way Rabbi Yossi Paltiel broke it down is koyach ma is the ability to say what? To have bittel. What does that mean? You work on something in the creative field, in math, in science, whatever it is that you, you're thinking, you're trying to create, you're trying to break through something. You have an idea, or you have the germ of an idea, and you're working, and you're working, and you're working, and you're working, and at some point, you give up. At some point, if you have bittel, you say, you know what, I don't know. And not I don't know of a child not wanting to do their homework, oh, I don't know, but a deep, I hit a brick wall, and I don't know where to go for, to from here. And that's part one of koyach ma, the ability to say what, the ability to, the bittel to give up. And then within that, part two of koyach ma, as is, was explained, is that your subconscious talks to your conscious. Your nefer, uh, your chayechido talks to your nefer ruch neshama. Your subconscious talks to your conscious, and you get this flash of lightning. This flash, this insight, this idea. And this insight is relative to the effort that you put in. The more effort you put in, and you're trying and trying and trying and trying and trying, and then you hit a brick wall, that amount of effort reflects in the idea that you have. And the less effort, then, of course, the less wow that thought is. And we all have ideas, and we all have ideas constantly, and some ideas are incredible, and some ideas just come and go. And of course, Bina is developing that idea, taking that Bria Kamavrik, taking that flash, and then fleshing it out. And Bina can take a whole lifetime on a single concept. Bina can take forever, and of course Das is integrating it, making it real to you and making it real to others. So very briefly, in my experience, I created a painting, and unfortunately, we're, we're living through post-October 7th, more terror in Eretz Yisrael, but years ago, on a Tuesday morning, there was a terrorist attack in a shul in Harnof. And Eretz Yisrael is a few hours ahead of us. When we woke up, the news was full of images and, and the story of Yidin gathering together to daven in Yerushalayim and getting butchered to death, literally, for being Jewish and davening in Yerushalayim. And that cut and that hurt so deeply, I was compelled I had to do something. I felt I, I wanted and needed and had to do something. And I called a Rav and I said, can I take a talus and rip a talus apart? and essentially kind of like recreate the scene to memorialize these people who were lost because unfortunately time goes on and we forget. And the Rav said, as long as the tzitzis are intact, you could rip the begad for the purpose of not, not to de desecrate it, but to do something positive with it. So I took paint, red paint and dark paint and, and the talus and I put it flat, I, I let it, put it all, I painted it flat on the table and when I was finished, I looked at it, and I felt that I had achieved what I had set out to achieve. It wasn't beautiful. I don't recommend anyone hanging it on their wall, but it was a piece that really memorialized these victims. And as I stood back from the piece, I said, I have some extra talus, some more piece of talus. Not all of it made it onto the canvas. This is not our whole story. In that moment, while my hands were still wet, I said, I have to create another piece that celebrates us, Yidden, and Yiddishkeit, v'chai bahen. This is not our whole story. We get cut down, but we rise up again and we continue. And that was my beginning of Chachma. I knew I had this piece of talus, and I knew I had to create something positive and uplifting with it. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And I went on tour with some of my paintings, and I would show this piece titled Harnof. 
And I talk about the desire to make another piece, but I didn't know what and I didn't know how. And the first yard site of Harnoff came and went and I started to feel like a, a fraud, an imposter, that I, I want to do something, but I can't. And, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to complete that piece. And then Sarah Litvin and Ariel Beagle got married. They were getting ready to get married. And on the Thursday before their wedding, Sarah's father, brother, and younger sister were driving to the Ufruf, and the father and brother were brutally murdered on their way to the Ufruf just before the wedding, days before the wedding. And Sarah, in her incredible deep wisdom, as a Jewish woman said, the wedding is going on. We're not gonna let those animals stop our simcha. And she said, Am Yisrael is invited to my wedding. And if you remember, the most incredible thing is Am Yisrael showed up to her wedding. Thousands upon thousands of people from all over the world, communities, made a raffle and sent someone. You were told you only had 15 minutes inside there because you had to get out so that other people could get in. And people were dancing in the streets, Am Yisrael Chai. And I realized that is my part two of my wedding, of, of my piece. And it took me a long time, but I made a chuppah. And again, I don't have the images here and I apologize. I made a chuppah with that same piece of ripped talus with red on it, and it took me a while to make it. The Bina, the Chachma I'm good at. Bina takes me a little bit longer. It took a while because I knew what it was there, and so now I have two pieces. The original one is 40 by 40, it's a little bit smaller. The second one is bigger, it's 48 by 48, and it celebrates our eternal Am Yisrael Chai. And I think it's a little bit relevant to today that yes, Am Yisrael Chai, we do continue, we do live on, the Chai Behen. So this is just my own little experience of the creative process of Yichsidus. We all are here celebrating chsedus, celebrating creativity, celebrating the intersection of the two. And the bottom line is we're given gifts. We're given gifts, we're all given gifts. If I may say, for 10 years, I have a wonderful story for another time, but for 10 years I served as a youth rabbi in a town in New Jersey, and I thought that was the ultimate of everything that I could do in this world. And little by little, the Abishter nudged me and nudged me and nudged me and it got to the point I was creating and it got to the point I couldn't do both and actually my, my former boss who was so understanding and, and delicate about this said, you know, make a choice. And I chose to create art full time and I believe this is my shlichus, this is the gift that the Abishta gave me and I'm doing the best I can to channel it and to share it with the world. And really that is our job. All of us here, whether you're painting, whether you're drawing, whether you're, whatever form of creativity, we all have this expression, this soul, this neshama, and we all have a responsibility to share our incredible uniqueness with the world because that's the way we will bring Mashiach together. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Muli. It's very interesting how we, uh, how we spoke about Chabad in the intro and you walked us through the artistic process of how it goes from Chachma to Bina to Das. And if anybody's ever struggling with their development of the idea, just know the greats do it too. So that's good. He said we can sit on Bina for a while. So that's good to know. Now, the next speaker I want to call up is actually an inspiration for this entire event. This event is first predecessed by an uh, essay competition. And what I, I, I submitted my own essay to that. I did not win. But by going through the process of creating the art in your situation, or by me when I wrote the essay, just by doing the process of coming up with an idea, trying to flesh it out, going and making it and creating it, that is, you're a winner already. We've already won just by coming here, submitting. I feel like a winner that I get to bask in all this wonderful art. So already call Kavod and thank you. And another very inspirational thing, besides for this whole event, that was inspired by his previous work. But our next speaker, his entire gang, in recent years at least, has been to make Hasidus practical. The idea that we learn these ideas, and Atzillus, and Chachma, and these are massive, huge ideas, mm -hmm. but really, it's a practical way to live our life. And it's very, very important how I see now, I'm looking at all the art, the ideas that you guys are obviously dealing with, struggling with, these are deep, deep mystical ideas that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's really beautiful to see how you guys are bringing it into practical reality. And um, to call him up 
as a great inspirer of this event and of people around the world, please welcome Rabbi Simon Jacobson. Good afternoon. This is not for the mic here. I hear it's for the stream only, so. Um, I want to open up firstly with a prayer and our uh, hearts and souls go out to all the Eden in Eretz Yisrael. Hashem protects them more than anywhere else in the world, but yet, especially in a time like this, after the recent events, I think we can't ignore you know, we're all part of one organism. It's one piece of art, just different parts, that we are all together with them, and our prayers are with them. The Ibishta should give them the complete protection, especially of the Tzahal, the holy soldiers on the front lines that sacrifice their lives every moment. For all Eden, and everywhere Eden should be protected, and we should march into Pesach, to Yeral of Nisan and Pesach, to Gula, Mitiz, Vashlema, complete shalom and peace permanently, and all the forces of evil should be eradicated and transformed into good. Okay. So thank you for having me. Thank you for your kind words. Um, you went to Chachma Bin Adas. I'm going to go into uh, the super conscious beyond Chachma. Okay, because it doesn't begin with Chachma. Okay. <laughs> So, um, if I may quote, uh, Picasso, you ever heard of him? So Picasso famously said that art is a lie that reveals a deeper truth. Because all art is uh, stationary, essentially, and all of life is mobile. And uh, so I would like to add, if I could, that Chassidus is a uh, truth that reveals a deeper lie. And I'll explain why. Handel Lieberman, one of the Hasidic artists of the previous generation, one of the pioneers, together with Zalman Kleiman, who depicted and painted the old shtetl and captured it so vividly. At the time when we were growing up as children, no one knew that they would become Superstars at the time, they were just two Hasidic schleppers here in Crown Heights. And uh, so in case you feel you're that way, you never know where your future is going. Um, and then as time passed, you start valuing what they were able to um, achieve. So he wrote a letter to the Rebbe. Being an artist, you could imagine he had a complex soul. And part of it was also that he dealt with uh, depressing moments, darker moments. And he wrote to the Rebbe about his depression and about how down he feels and the fatalistic and resigned. And the Rebbe wrote back to him, it's a letter that's available, that he's surprised that he's writing this way because being an artist, one of the things of an artist is never to look at the surface of things but to show us the soul of the events and the inner choreography, I'm paraphrasing, of uh, what the real story is. So the fact that he's writing that he's down and depressed, that's only looking at the surface. And if he dug deeper into the bigger story, the greater narrative, so to speak, he would find so much positivity and beauty. So in other words, the Rebbe was basically saying that you're not applying your artistic ability to your own personal life. You're projecting it for others, but you yourself. But that's not uncommon. You find many often the artists, like they say about clowns, they make other people laugh while they're crying inside. So with that said, so Picasso came from his perspective, you know, trying what we call from the bottom up, trying to use his artistic ability as so many other artists do, to look at the world with a new set of eyes, and allow us a glimpse into a deeper picture, whether it's of a personality or a, or a natural sight or an abstract art. What Chassidus does is the exact opposite. 
it uh, looks at the world through God's eyes. And to see from the top down, you know, what, through the lens of the divine, the ultimate artist who created it all, what was his deeper intention and the spirit behind everything, and then try to capture it in some form of art. So both have tremendous value, but if you can bring the two together, they converge, art and chassidus, you really have the best of both worlds. So being that you spoke about Chachma being a das, let's go for a little trip beyond Chachma. You know, Chachma is known to be, you mentioned Chachma, the power of what? You know, the flash of an idea, the spark of an idea. But the big question everyone asks is, where do ideas come from? That's all fine. Once you have a spark and a flash, and then the challenge is how to turn it into bina, flesh it out, and develop it into a full-blown picture. But how do you get Chachmah triggered in the first place? So there are, uh, we shall say, uh, alternative methods, some foreign substances some people try to use to open up those channels. Um, I'm not going to get now into commentary whether that works or doesn't work, and how permanent or temporary that may be. But maybe, I don't know if you'll be surprised to know, but this is really the essence of what uh, Chassidus is. So you may have heard the expression, Chassidus often cites the language from Kabbalah, from the Arizal, and from Zohar, a thing called Chochmes Tema. Chochmes Tema, loosely translated, how I translate it would be super, super conscious wisdom. You know, literally it means the hidden wisdom. So conscious wisdom is that spark as soon as you become aware of an idea. But what's on the other side of the curtain? What's going on behind the, behind the scenes or under the dashboard or whatever the expression you want to use? Like what's happening on the other side? So psychology likes to use the word collective unconsciousness or collective consciousness, that there's somewhere a type of reservoir of infinite amount of intelligence and there's only a very, sh a very uh, narrow uh, channel that allows consciousness to be born from there. But Chassidus goes into elaborate discussion of what's going on on that side of the other side of the curtain. And indeed, actually teaches us how to broaden the channels. You know, there's an expression they say there's a very thin line between uh, madness and genius. Anybody has to deal with that uh, line here? You don't have to raise your hands. Huh? So... <laughs> Why? Because, um, um, because madness, even though it sounds so, um, so, uh, so negative, but in fact, it, it really comes down to the fact that conscious intelligence is actually limited experiences. You know, just to use a simple example, God forbid someone goes through any trauma or loss, or for that matter, any joyous experience, but especially a negative one. If we were to live constantly with the initial trauma that we had, we have no way we could ever survive. It's important that we forget, or at least the temperature goes down, because our minds actually have chemicals that compartmentalize. So very intense events that happen in our lives ultimately get so-called closed up in one closet. You can access it, but what happens is if those, um, what they call a chemical imbalance, or there's something that breaks down the boundaries between the compartments of our mind, then that could either lead to madness because you just can't, you're overwhelmed by so much experience. Imagine ideas didn't stop flowing. They say when the Mittler Rebbe would say chassidus, sometimes he would say sha, sha, sha still. Because the mind, the flow, the nevias hamechen was so intense, he had to like quiet it down and silence it. The Ragachavar, another great genius, on Shabbos he had tremendous amount of pain because he could not write down his ideas. So it was just flowing and it just overwhelmed him. So think of like a reservoir, literally, like in your kitchen sink, suddenly the faucet breaks, what happens? It starts flooding, not due to the fact of lack of water, too much water. The same I think is with ideas. For ideas to really be able to be absorbed properly, it has to be like raindrops. A faucet that reg regulates the flow of the intelligence from the superconscious to the conscious. So if the channels are too narrow, then you have a limited amount of ideas. If they're too wide, you can either have total madness because it's so overwhelming. In other words, madness is actually closer to reality than sanity, let's put it that way. So if you ever feel insane, 
it actually coming from a very profound place. We have Shtus the Kedusha, and the Shtus the Lumaza. Shtus the Kedusha is a certain type of holy insanity where you're going beyond the rational, you're going beyond limitations. When we say Simcha, Pairiz Geder, Simcha, joy, breaks down barriers. You're breaking down the regular structures to go to a deeper place. That's why I'm Purim, Adalayada. To the point where you're beyond even the consciousness between the distinction between dark and, ni- and light and so on. Or it creates genius. So that's why there's a very thin line. You cross the line a little too much, the genius can become madness and vice versa. So the, cha- the challenge is how do you create a, w- a flow but not one that's overwhelming. And that's why in Chassidus there's so much talk about grounding yourself, what they call today integration. It's not just enough to have a deeper uh, superconscious experience. You have to be able to integrate it. What you call rotze and shuv, tension and resolution. So yes, it's very healthy for a person to have that a somewhat of angst that they reach to something beyond, but not too much or else you can expire. You know, I was always very fascinated by the Jimi Hendrixes and the Jim Morrisons and the Janis Joplins of our previous generation. I know you didn't come here to hear about them, but they were geniuses in their time. They all called the 24 Club. They all OD'd, unfortunately, at 24 years old. And they were no question geniuses, but they had no way grounding. They kept going up, 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 and there was nowhere to go. Had they learned a little chassidus, they would have learned that as deep as you go, you also have to have the channels that bring it back down and ground it. So in other words, it's not just about a, high, a spiritual high. It's not just about a transcendent experience. It's a transcendent experience that's channeled into a real life down below, into family, into love, into relationships. How many we hear about artists, how their selfishness, and in their genius, they were so selfish. How did they reconcile that? Because they didn't have this balance. They had one part, not the second part. So in a way, on a deeper level, you can say celebrating chassidus and art coming together is really the joining of the superconscious, we'll call it states of infinity, and how to channel that into the finite. Because ultimately, an artist, and the same thing with a musician, the same thing with a writer or a speaker, if they're really doing their job well, what they're really doing is giving us a taste of a higher reality that's not so visible and putting some image to it. It's like basically painting the invisible. The feelings, the sentiments, the things that you don't see with the naked eye. It's like giving structure to that which is beyond structure. Expressing the inexpressible, if you wish. So I've always found this to be an ultimate uh, gift that any one of us that is able to be, be, do that and encourage others to do that is really fulfilling, as was pointed out by, uh, what do we call you? Yitzhak Moli, one of the greats, okay? Um, that the, 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 the mission of our lives to bridge these two worlds the world of Chach Mistema and the world of Chach Magluya, and then from there to extend it through Bina into all of our faculties. After that come the Midas, so it gives birth to love and reverence and compassion and all the Midas, all the way through Malchus. So here's not the place to go through all of it, but the bottom line is that this is the essence of what Chassidus is. There's just many ways to do this. And the truth is when we do a mitzvah, we're doing exactly the same thing. You know, Chassidus asks the question, is a mitzvah finite or infinite? Because on one hand, it's very finite. Every mitzvah has its very clear parameters. You know, comes the, day, the night of Pesach, no chametz, only matzah, and exactly how much matzah you're supposed to eat. You know, Shabbos has its laws. Everything is precise to the, to the minute, to the second. All the shiurim, all the measurements. On the other hand, we say a mitzvah is God's will. And God is infinite and beyond infinite. So what Chassidus beautifully captures is that a mitzvah is actually bottling the infinite in the finite structures. It's really infinite, but it's just another way for the infinite to express itself is through a mitzvah. So when you do a good deed, a simple good deed, a little beautiful gesture, a penny to charity, in the finite what you're doing is channeling the infinite. And that's like the secret of all secrets. The Rebbe once wrote a letter to a conference on mysticism in England. The Rebbe wrote, what's unique about Jewish mysticism in, compar- in comparison to other schools of mysticism, especially in the Eastern world? He said the difference is that in Jewish mysticism, you can achieve more 
through an act than through a meditation. One act. Because you see, a meditation takes us to another higher place, but it doesn't bring it back down to earth. And a mitzvah brings it down to earth. And that is the, hard, the hardest job. Ask anyone who's artistic or creative, who lives in that world of energy, and sometimes that infinite is extremely difficult to ground yourself. It's very stream, extremely difficult to go after you have this creative uh, surge to suddenly say, okay, I have to diaper my baby's bi diapers, you know, or I have to uh, be, do, do so, a simple act that seems so humble, it's like it's be beneath me because I'm a genius, I'm an artist. And that is ultimately the challenge of bringing and balancing the two. Rabbi Akiva was the only one that was able to go into a place like that. Nichnas b'shalom v'yatsa b'shalom. He went in peace and came in peace. It also means in one piece, meaning complete and wholesome, where the other three, each one, one went mad, mad again, one died, and one became an apostate. Because when you enter those deeper realms of the superconscious states, it's not that simple. It can be very dangerous even, as, as deep as it may be. Not of an avil, in the, in the Beis Hamikdash, in the Mishkan, they burned out, literally. First burnout in history, it says, a zara, a strange flame, strange fire. You may be familiar with that expression, it's straight from Chumash, where it says that they went in, but they did not know how to contain it. And they came from a great place. So I want to com commend um, the, the organizers and all of you that participate and all of us that are here, family and so on, that you're part of a historic process maybe the end of the last steps before Mashiach coming, where we're bridging two worlds. And this is where Chassidus comes, a deeper truth that reveals the lie. It reveals the lie of the superficial universe, that the world that we look at with our naked eyes is not, the reality, is not reality. It's the tip of the iceberg. It's a very surface reality. It's a surface reality where we see things with limited, with limited tools and parameters. And to, you, to quote um, Sir Arthur Eddington, if I may, he was a physicist and he said, when people asked him in the beginning when quantum mechanics was just coming on, becoming popular and becoming known with all its counterintuitive and bizarre conclusions, so he was asked, no one ever saw an atom, let alone a subatomic particle. How do you come to all these strange conclusions? Which were literally contradictory, things like things that, that, we, that, that uh, there's no definitive, there's no deterministic state, for example, for, for, for light or for other properties and so on. And he gave the analogy of a fisherman that spread his, his net across all the seas of the world. And he gathered all the different types of fish and he started documenting them. Yeah, different species, different colors, different shapes, different sizes. And after his long research, the fisherman came to a, a, a genius conclusion. He decided and determined there are no fish in the sea that are shorter than half inch long. Okay, he was about to make this big announcement when his little daughter sees what he's about to say. She says, Daddy, what are you saying? We have a fish tank here with goldfish that are shorter than half inch long. You don't even have to go to the seas. So of course, after observing the net that he used, his net had spaces, the ropes, or half inch spaces. So imagine all the fish that were shorter than half inch simply fell back into the water. So he just has to add one thing in his brilliant uh, thesis, and that is that if you use a net with half inch spaces, you're never gonna catch fish uh, half inch, shorter than half inch long. But I don't think you need a wizard or a scientist to know that, I think we all know that. So in other words, the problem was not with the, 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 with the fish, it was the instruments that we use. And what artists do is they teach us new instruments, how to look at the world with a new set of eyes. And that's what Chassidus does. To look at the world that what you see on the surface level is only the external. Inside is a neshama, a soul. Souls are invisible, but invisible to the naked eye. They're not invisible to another neshama. So souls see souls and we experience souls. So it's really about expanding our uh, containers, our instruments, if you wish, our tools. And when you expand them, then you're able to contain and experience things that are far beyond that which is uh, visible to the naked eye and to our senses. So it's really going into the supersensory or the superconscious world and drawing it down into this world. And in, in the essence, that is what Mashiach is when we say there will be no more evil and destruction in the world because what? The world will be filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. What's the connection? 
Because when you have divine knowledge that's coming from these higher states of consciousness, and you bring that into this conscious world, there is no room for destruction or violence or hate, or for that matter, divisiveness, because we're all part of one larger whole. We're all, yes, we're all, we're all pieces of one more beautiful cosmic piece of art that God created. And when we look at each other, we're able to look at each other as being one part of that bigger picture, where each of us is indispensable and necessary, and each of us needs the other to complement uh, us. And when you look at it that way, that the world is one beautiful mosaic of art, each of us fulfilling our particular role, and therefore respecting that. And as I said, complementing each other, it's a whole different way to look at the world. So hopefully, maybe we can bottle and replicate and scale this uh, formula that we have here through this art and through the bridging of these worlds and bring it to the larger world. They need it now more than ever where there's a moral compass that's lacking and moral clarity as we see in the Middle East and Israel and so on. You just see, you talk about lies revealing a deeper truth. You see the lies out there. So the more we shine light and clarity and truth, the more powerful it dispels the confusion and the darkness and the fragmentation and creates that ultimate Hashem Echad unity, which is the cardinal rule of all beautiful art. So again, I commend you all. Rabba in this uh, effort, making it happen. Thank you so much. And uh, no, really, and uh, you should all applaud each other right now. Give it applause. <laughs> everyone, everyone should have a kosher for and Pesach, especially this year. Benisan Nigalu, Benisan Asidin Goyal, time of our redemption is this month, a time of miracles, Nisim, Nisim from the word Nes, t- double Nisim. And as I said before, we should march even before Pesach, and before Yer Aleph Nisim to the Geula, the end of the nightmares that we're seeing. Hashem should continue showering His brachas and His miracles as we've just seen just, this, uh, just yesterday. And we uh, shouldn't even need these miracles and just have Shalom V'nesati Shalom Baris now and forever. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reb Simon. Wow. It's amazing when we gather, and in, if you look around this room, it's very interesting. It's a very wide audience. It's very, um, it's intergenerational. And it's, we are here because we were meant to be the inspirers. But it's really, it's really amazing to see the last, I don't want to say the last generation. That's a little offensive. I apologize. But to see our leaders and our inspirations and we started speaking about Chachma Bina and Das, and he's like, no, it goes beyond. It's ayin, it goes into the subconscious, the superconscious. So it's really amazing. And I really appreciate the term he used for what you guys are doing is bottling the infinite. What Hashem did with a mitzvah to take these abstract, massive ideas and make it practical and physical is exactly what you guys are doing with your art. And it says about Adam, we mentioned that he was the first artist, says that he gave names to all the animals and all the plants. Adam named everything. And how do you name something? Is by knowing its true essence. Same thing with, that's why Hashem gave Chachma, Bina, and Das to Betzalel. Why does Betzalel need the deepest understanding to be an artist? Is because if you're going to depict something that is bottling the infinite, you have to understand its real, true essence. So that is your Aveda. And it's very exciting to see. And I personally want to call up our next artist who he inspired me because all of his art, I grew up watching it everywhere. It depicts the places in our, in our uh, all the beautiful holy places, all of the beautiful mitzvahs and rituals. And they were always depicted and presented with pleasantness. You look at it and you are like, wow, this is gishmak. It's the, gishmak means like enjoyable. Yeah, it's really enjoyable. We mentioned the previous generation of artists, Rabbi Kleinman, and how they were depicting very powerful things that were a little intense, a little aggressive almost, and call it kavod. But to have an artist that I grew up with, that everything was bidnachas, it was 
pleasure and just enjoyable. So I very much feel like he has a deep insight into this world and he's able to bottle the infinite in a way that shows it's true, how all the mitzvahs are really pleasant and beautiful. And with that, I want to call up Reb Michal Muchnik. Okay, hi everyone. It's a, uh, uh, wait, can you hear me? Everybody can hear me? Good. It's, talk about enjoyable. This is Michal Machnik. Who didn't hear? Okay. I talk about enjoyable and gishmak. This is very gishmak <laughs> for someone who, for, I would say, it's been over 50 years. It's actually, this year is the, is the jubilee year that I actually had yechidus with the Rebbe, and I brought in pieces of artwork to my first yechidus. And this is a, like, almost like a fulfillment, I think, of some of the Rebbe's dreams. You can't hear me? Are you kidding me? I don't have a loud voice. Okay, we'll do the best we can. Okay. Um, First of all, um, I prepared this whole thing, but then half the people who spoke, uh, in fact, all of them have already covered most of that territory. <laughs> so I'm going to tell more stories, which probably everybody would like after all that intellectual stuff, and most artists aren't that intellectual. Um, and it's very, very interesting. What? You should take that back from Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take it back. Um, if you were ask most artists what their most creative moments, where did it come from? Inevitably, they will say it didn't come from a certain thought or a certain experience, maybe experience, but it, is, it just came to them. Like you could be in the midst of all kinds of things and you're, you have artist block or you're not feeling creative and sometimes just something just comes into you. And I totally resonate with Rabbi J- what Rabbi Jacobson was saying, that it really is coming from a higher place. And when the, we have those moments of a flash of an idea, that, we, that the ability to take it down and bring it down is a quite challenging. Um, interestingly enough, um, uh, when I, I and he, <laughs> you covered a lot of territory, Rabbi Jacobson. <laughs> and I listen to you online, and I know you, car- you, you cover a lot of territory. Um, I am from that 60s. I am from that whole, you know, all those names. I knew those people, you know. I didn't, I, I didn't have parties with them, but, you know, they were part of my life. And uh, it's very, very true what you were saying. And um, my first year in, in yeshiva, so we were, I was in the first class at the first Baharim, and we were... Uh, we had the, the merit to go into the Lubavitch Rebbe for personal yechidus uh, after our birthday. So I was one of the first eight Bahram who are, were permitted to do that. And that was 50 years ago. So um, what was so amazing to me, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. I really did not know what to expect. I was frightened. Um, and I walked in and I brought th- three little samples of my art to show the Rebbe. And at that point, I was like, you know, new Balshuva, and what we learned about the Rebbe was if the Rebbe says yes, then yes. The Rebbe says no, no. So I was willing, if I'm going to be an artist, I have to ask the Rebbe if I can continue this way. Maybe I should be a sofa, a scribe. I, and I asked the Rebbe these questions. In any which case, the Rebbe was speaking very, very practically and calmly, and it was a very interesting experience. We'll go into another time. You can read about it. It's been written up, different things in my experiences. But what was most fascinating was that um, the Rebbe's ability to um, empower those with talents and different things that we were blessed with. And um, where am I going with this? Okay. Um, I just wanted, oh, so I'll go, okay. I just wanted to mention that. There's many other things I go on forever about that. There's so many things that went on in that yechidus and that, that played out many years to come. Um, I wanted to share with you, like later on, because one of the things the Rebbe said was I should print things. I think the Rebbe had 
like a lot of faith that my artwork would be such that would be teaching Hasidus and it would be giving over inspiring things. And he warned that I shouldn't just stick to my originals, but I should print things and many more people would be able to, like another practical thing that the Rebbe was speaking. So um, later when I made my first edition of lithograph, it was this village scene, which had a, a thousand things in it. It was like this whole, like, uh, I don't know what do you want to call it, whimsical thing. And this, what the Rebbe said that to me, he, I sent it in one of the prints, and the Rebbe sent out uh, uh, like uh, haroz, which means like um, instructions, something instructions. Tr problem was I already made it, but that's besides the point. Anyway, so the Rebbe said that he noticed in the bottom left-hand corner that there is a hospitality hotel and a, um, um, a free loan fund. I mean, there was a whole bunch of things. I used to put little signs on the doors and everything. So the Rebbe said, Those, these are things from Gamilas Chasadim, which um, uh, having guests and then having, you know, like giving tzedakah. And the Rebbe said, therefore, since Api Kabbalah or Api Chasidis, they come from the right kav, like this Torah, Avodah, Gamilas Chasadim. So the Rebbe said they should be not on the left side of the picture, but on the right side of the picture. And then the Rebbe said in the top right hand corner, there was, there was this little house, a shul on, on a tree house or something. And they were davening, and the Rebbe said, that's tefillah, tefillah is a voda, and that's from the left kabapi, I don't know if there was a like Kabbalah or chassidus, mm -hmm. and therefore it shouldn't be on the right side of the picture, it should be on the left side of the picture. Mm -hmm. And then the Rebbe said, and yonam of Torah study and Torah should be in the middle. So ever since then, of course, I've been true to that, that thing. But what I want to sh express here is how the Rebbe was teaching me and teaching us that we are, that this is exactly what it is to apply an idea of Hasidus in the work of art and that it should be something practical in actually your daily life. Which, which one I, I had once, I don't want to go the whole story, but I, was, I, I came back from some exhibitions and it made me so anxious, I didn't know if I wanted to continue doing this. Uh, and, but, you know, I was selling, so I, I, I asked her, what can I do? And one of the things the Rebbe said to do was to put a siddur, pushka, tilam, and a, a chumash at the right side, at, at the side of an exhibition, so people should see that. Besides your art, they should, see, I, but how I, I took it was that they should see that this is not just a picture of Judaism, but we actually do it. Like Maisahua Iker. Okay. So, these things have helped me, Rabbi Jacobson, not OD. You understand? Okay. Um, however, I do actually totally resonate with the, with the, um, with the, what the, the genius madness um, issue. It never ends, okay? And when you get older, it's, it, it's even a, it, gets even, it gets even more exciting. Anyway, um, um, what I would want to give everybody a big yesher koyach, and it was already said everybody is a winner. I have to tell you, I was one of the judges, and you can't blame me if you lose, because I don't have any idea what the other four judges judged. I mean, maybe we'll get together for coffee afterwards and like, you know, figure what was really going on. But, and I have to say something else, that we were given to judge by, by having your pictures sent online to our phones. I have to tell you, now that I'm here and seeing the originals that I do see and a lot of them are not, and a lot of them are not here, I may have judged a little bit differently. Because when you see the texture, you see maybe the size, you see the amount of work that goes into something, it all has an effect. So one thing I just want to mention is that what I do appreciate from everybody here also, that's why I gave no one low numbers, okay? I didn't give anybody, I all started at five and went up because I felt like everybody deserved. <laughs> to take in any idea of Hasidus and trying to bring it down into a piece of artwork is very, very challenging. Now, if you're asked to illustrate something in a book or you're a graphic designer and you're doing it for a magazine or for something, it's a little bit easier because the picture comes along with the explanation. But when you're doing a basic piece of art which is gonna hang in someone's home or something like that, it's much more of a challenge that people should be able to hop what you're trying to say. There are beautiful explanations here and I never really was able to figure that out myself. When I had exhibitions, I would make a lot of those explanations and I would put them by the paintings because I feel, look, we are people of book 
and you know, when we learn Hasidus, we should share that. So no one, everybody should always feel free to do that, any of your artwork, and to put it on the back when you sell it. So the people really, really do appreciate it. It's a beautiful way to be Makar of people. I think the Rebbe appreciated that so much. And I think that's one reason why the, the Rebbe gave me, me a lot of attention when I would go to exhibitions and give me like interesting shlich mitzvah, like different amounts of money in the currency of the country. Just very interesting things which really, really pumped me up, you want to call it. Anyhow. Oh, okay, where are we up to now? I just want to tell you, oh, that then for all of you that feel like, you know, you know, you don't like criticism, just be happy I didn't put any comments on the <laughs> online. <laughs> I mean, and for all practical purposes, like I can breathe a little bit. I don't think I have to worry about too much competition. No, that was just a joke. Just a joke. Just a joke. <laughs> just a joke. Anyhow, um, no, I really was very impressed with a lot of the things I saw. And I actually thought it was actually beautiful that it wasn't just for professional or people who wanted to be judged professionally, but also that there was you know, kids of all ages. And I, thought, uh, I just thought that was really a beautiful blend. And I think that that's like, we're just, you know, like we don't have demarcations, you know, it's like generational goals, which, which just brings up th another story that when I first came, there was only two other artists, which was mentioned by Rabbi Jacobson, which is uh, Zalman Kleiman and Handel Lieberman, both all of a shalom. And so, what do you do? I'm an artist. So I went to visit both of them. But I went to visit, uh, they used to call him Fetter Handel. When I went to visit uh, uh, Handel Lieberman, so I came in and I showed him some of my art. And he just, I don't know, he didn't say anything. He just sort of made some, some sound. I don't know what it was. And then I was waiting for him to say something, and he said, uh, you should go to art school. <laughs> well, that, that was his idea, but the truth is I had left art school to come to, and became Chabad, and I don't think the Rebbe was too interested for me to go back to art school. And, and Baruch Hashem, things worked out with the Rebbe's bracha. Anyway, um, um, what I always like to do when I speak, and I think it's ridiculous they ask artists to speak because the way, the way that we express ourselves is through painting, but Again, we have to go against our nature, so I, I've, over, I've been asked to speak, and I spoke. So um, I just want to thank uh, Rabbi, uh, I want to thank Menachem Meltzer, who's been... Um, uh, I learned from him that if you want to get something done, you do what he did. He just, one day, uh, he just walked into my studio, which is, by the way, by appointment. There wasn't one. <laughs> just sat down and said, hi, I'm Menachem Meltzer. <laughs> yeah, what are you doing here? Well, you know, and he told me. So in any which case, but you know, you have to have a little chutzpah. So anyway, bless you for all the good things you did. And um, it's really wonderful to see everybody and to see a lot of Bubbies and Zadies who came to be supportive of their, their children or grandchildren that, that were doing artwork. Oh, there's one. OK, and um, um, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't announce this, make an announcement about this, but it's like since, yeah, but Menachem said to do it. No, I'm just, I have a studio. It's not in Crown Heights proper. It's a little bit down the ways. My art workshop, and I also do some workshops there, but um, I'm expanding my space to have like a gallery showroom and a, um, uh, like a healing arts little center. And Mirza Hashem, and I really think that it was a Shkacha Brothers. This just sort of came about very recently, and to do this, this, and uh, I thought it was a Shkacha Brothers, so I, I am mentioning that. Um, don't call, I'll call you when it's done, okay? <laughs> Ready. Uh, anything else? Okay. Anyway, oh, so again, again, one more thing about the judging. I'm sure the judges will agree. This is art. They told, the, we, I, that we had five judges. I don't know what one of them was, but two of them were artists, and the other two were like rabbinical types, okay? And, um, you know, so they, we were supposed to only judge on the art and the originality, and they were supposed to judge on the, the concept, the Hasidic concepts and the originality. Okay, whatever. How all that comes together. So, I mean, trust me, 
There were some people that had fantastic pieces of art, but they didn't have maybe the most concept. And there are other people that wrote these people, pull them, that I'm just, I couldn't even read them. And, and their art was like, you could see they couldn't draw a straight line. So having said all that, like how all this came out, it came out, you know, okay? Whatever it was, it's really like, really, everybody's a winner. And, and thank you very much for it. Wow, 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 wow. Thank you, Ed Michal, for the inspiration, the laughs. Always a pleasure. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> I, loved, I loved the story you said, Ed Michal, about going to the Rebbe and how particular he was about where things should be based on our Kabbalah. And as artists, as Reb Simmons said, that you're bottling the infinite, it's important to, as much as we can, understand the infinite. That's why B'Tzala was given the Chachma Bin and Das. I'm Alter. Hi. <laughs> I'm not an art. Actually, Rebbe Chal said that he went to see his previous generation, Rebbe Zalman Kleinman and all of them, and he said, go to art school. I visited Rebbe Michal in his studio a few years ago, and he said, don't go to art school. <laughs> so, a little, a little different, a uh, little different story. But um, it's interesting to note how um, the Ram Chal wrote a book. It's called Mishkine Elyain. And he talks about how the base of Mikdash is all the dimensions and all the sections and all the vessels, everything about the base of Mikdash is an expression of how Hashem's hashpa and shefa comes from the source and makes its way through the different channels into our, eventually, hopefully our pockets, our lives, our bellies, all the things. And the entire structure of the world follows the pathways from God's blueprint. And Amir Tashem, the more you study, the more you will have, and then you could make and bottle, the, bottle that infinite for the art to inspire. Also, it's very important, I think, this generation more than any other, because we know there was art in the past. David Amalek wrote it to Hillim, and he wrote it with a harp, and he put even, he has the trump inside the Tehillim. He wrote music. We don't know the music. Art got lost back in the day. They didn't really have a way to, to save it, to make it transfer through the generations. In this generation... We now have the means to save, preserve, bring it to the next generation. So all the art that you create is not just inspiring the people in your Dalit Amis. With the internet, you could inspire the entire world. And with the hard drives, you could inspire the generations to come as well. So what you are doing is so important for now and forever. And Mir Shem forever will come very soon too. So that's exciting. And my next speaker that I want to call up is somebody who understands the beauty of art to inspire, as well as to create community. When we are sharing, when we are creating, it makes us come closer. I could see into your soul. You can describe a piece of your mind to me visually. And our next speaker has a beautiful organization called Brush Hour, it's very cute. They get uh, the next generation together and they make art together and it's really, really beautiful. And maybe he'll talk about it more or whatever he wants, but to call up Rabbi Mendy Wolf. Yeah. Is it Mendel? I apologize. Hey, it was beautiful, beautiful. There's a lot of energy in this room, and there's... There's a lot of energy in this room, and the Oilem is not looking for speeches. The Oilem is looking to hear the announcement, who's the winners, that's why everybody is here. So I'm only here to set the stage from when that announcement is made. The energy now is high, and afterwards, some yes and some not. <laughs> and the idea is that it should be everybody yes. And I want to share one thought. We're all sitting here, but I'm sure that every single one of us, inside of our hearts, we're thinking also about Eretz Yisrael. Everything is Bashkacha Pratis. I believe that us gathering here today is not just about a contest. It's about opening another front in combating anti-Semitism and assimilation and the indifference that our youth feel towards Yiddishkeit. Art is a platform. <laughs> I think it's very important that every single participant here leaves feeling 
that it's, this is a beginning. This is not an end. And the beginning is, I used my tools. I used my chushim that I have to shock the world about Yiddishkeit. To share with the world the beauty that a speech can't give. They say a picture is worth more than a thousand words. And art reveals the real picture. People have stereotypes. People have blockages towards Yiddishkeit. Imagine if every single artist sitting here today commits to creating pieces that would express the attachment that we have to Eretz Yisrael, the attachment that we have to another Yid, the attachment that we have to Torah Mitzvahs, the feeling that we have in Yiddishkeit and flood the marketplace with these pieces. Brush Hour actually is to share whatever pieces they can create with that organization and on your own, look at pieces of art like missiles. In, in the universities and campuses, and that should be the stage when the winners are announced. So the word everyone is a winner is not just a line. It's a reality. I'm not giving any drushes, and now let them announce the winners. <laughs> Thank you, Rabbi Wolf. And now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has arrived. It's very exciting. Yes, we're all getting so excited. The winners. Ah. And may your art be inspiring and may your art win the war. I'd like to call up Rabbi Yitzchak Muli one more time to present the winners. And let's get that little tension. I'm feeling it in the room. It's good. It's good. Here he comes, ladies and gentlemen. All right. <laughs> All right, the moment we've been waiting for. Um, Baruch Hashem, I was not one of the judges. Uh, Menachem contacted me. I was uh, technical support. I was available for Menachem 24-7 with all his calls. So again, a round of applause for Menachem who had this concept and brought it to reality. Should I read the, the, the rules again or the judging process? Is that necessary? No. no. Okay, just <laughs> all the judges... All the points, each judge judge on their own. third place. Beginning with a hobbyist third place is Yaakov Barron from Florida. Where is the picture? Menachem, that's a good point. Where is his picture? Okay, Menachem, do you, can you get all of the winner, winning pictures here? Yes, go grab them. I'll stall. Um, we're going to show which ones win. Very, very good point. Thank you. Um, all right, while we're waiting, I wasn't going to, I, I missed my chance to share this earlier when I spoke. When Michal was talking about new initiatives. I've been thinking for a very long time about creating a podcast, exploring and sharing Jewish creativity. So, Baruch Hashem, I've recorded two episodes so far, and I have more to come titled Orange Socks. Uh, it's, a, it's a peace of mind that has a, a, a story of its own. Menachem, you have all the pieces? Okay, you got to move fast. Uh, so, please God, soon we'll have celebrating more creativity. Please God, soon we'll have celebrating more creativity. All right, no, this is, third, this is the third place. Yes? What is that? Okay. All right, second place. Second place in the hobbyist is... Dvora Leia Strasberg from Crown Heights. Is she in the house? Is she here? Does anyone know which piece? Where's Dvora Leia's piece? It's also over there. The white frame. All right, pass it up. So, here for the camera, this is second. This is the second place, Dvorlea Strasbourg. Hopefully you can all see. Ayashikoyach Dvorlea. 
You got the next one? Quickly, go get it. So while we're waiting for the while we are waiting for the third first place, this is the third place piece. This is by Jakob Barron from Florida, third place. And, all right, first place, I'm stalling, his Menachem is grabbing it from next door, but first place of the hobbyist for Chassidus in color is Mendel Haston from New Haven. And he's in the house. He is here. And here it is for the camera. Yes, good. Shkoch Mendel. Okay, and now we are on to. So to clarify, the hobbyists as non-professionals, the hobbyist category were for people who are not professionals and don't make their art full time. So these are our kids or kids at heart, people who create, who want to create, but are not full-time creators or, or take themselves professionals. Thank you, that's the word. So now on to the professional category. It's not here, okay. Third place in the professional category, third place is Esther Pinson from Crown Heights. Is the piece here? Is Esther Pinson here? Is her painting here? Painting not here? Is your painting, the painting's not here? Okay. That painting is not here, so we're gonna have to share it another way. Second place for the professional division is Fagy Baron from Moscow, now in Eretz Yisrael in Migdal Amik. So here it is. There we go, all right. And that is it for me. Rabbi Michal Machnik will finish off the last place. The first place. First place. No, no, I don't have it. I don't have it. Go ahead. Wait a minute. I want to get the name right. The name is Raskin. 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 Okay. Okay. And the first place winner is... Shimshin Gansberg from London, England. But the piece is the piece is not here. You'll see it. You'll see it on COL, COL tomorrow, I guess. On COL tomorrow, probably. You'll see it online. All right. Now we have. I understand that it's a little tough to maintain your seats after the main event has already happened, but uh, for our next speaker, the one who put this all together, give him a, a minute of your time because he really gave us all a wonderful experience today. Please, Menachem Meltzer. I want to say that this contest is an individualistic contest. You hear me? This contest is an individual individualistic contest, which means that it's not like some major organization like Coke and they know how to do things. This came together because 166 submissions came of people who worked literally for months and some people they, they started and uh, they made it through Purim and they came through, but months and put a lot of effort into it 
and a lot of those items only came in literally the last seconds. The last seconds of the contest was literally watching like uh, seconds go up on a clock. It was tick, 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 the last days, literally. 60, 70, it was amazing. Um, I want to finish off uh, dedicating what uh, this is about. Uh, I want to make a personal dedication. Um, this year is, uh, I wanted to make uh, not just a regular party, but uh, an amazing 60th birthday party for both my mother and my father. So I thought this was how I would get a crowd. I want to wish Mazel Tov to Rabbi and Mrs. Meltzer for 60 years for both of them. Um, just one last cute thing is that um, their birthdays actually are very close every year. Uh, but specifically this year, uh, my mother's and father's English and Hebrew birthday, I don't know how this usually happens, but this year it fell out on the same day, which was really cool because we have a lunar and solar eclipse specifically a few days ago. And my, my the parents are really, their birthdays are April 1st, they, uh, April, I'm sorry, April 2nd throughout um, Pesach this time. Um, so I want to hope I'm giving them a lot of nachas and I hope everyone here could give their parents a lot of nachas in their own uh, special way. That's it. Yitzchak Raskin. I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. And as a child, I used to always like to draw. I used to doodle in class. Art was uh, something that I enjoyed. One of the most underrepresented ideas in Hasidus is the arts. Chushim. All of Hasidus talks about God. And of course, part of what it does, it tries to give a person techniques and tools to bring God into themselves, to personalize God. And the classic version is the mind-heart version, the koiches, the faculties. What's not often discussed in Hasidus is the five senses. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching. And the five senses are connected to the arts. Seeing is the visual arts, hearing is music. When Hasidus talks about the arts, they make the following argument. That seeing, for example, or hearing, the chushim, are a shortcut to the soul. I now see the world heading to the next medium. And that also is going to be a quicker process, but we need thousands of people to be involved. Every generation made art, but it all got lost. In this generation, we can make art that Alaska was going to get lost if we didn't write it down. And Rabbi Huda Nasi went through a project of the Mishnah that followed up with the Talmud and it was all about writing it down. That was a 300 year process. If you're an artist, an artist, they see. If you're a musician, you don't just write music, you hear. You see God, you hear God. These are very direct ways of bringing God to a person to go straight into the soul. But because there's little struggle, because there's little labor, because there's less work, it's less sustained, it doesn't last as long, and it's less transforming. So ideally you want to combine what the arts give you with some learning, with some meditation. We know that when Mashiach comes, it'll be v'ra'u kol basar yachtav. Everybody will see that it's God's words that speaks. Back in the day, you looked in the book, you knew, but now you wanna just see it everywhere. If we want to be in Mashiach, we need to live into what they said Mashiach will look like. And this is one of the ways we do that. The way I see what we do here uh, in VR connect with Hasidus and Kala Art Contest is kind of taking these theoretical ideas or text and converting it into not just artwork, which is two-dimensional, but 3D and even 4D experiences if you take in time and gameplay. It's really increasing the dimensions and making it so immersive and real, as opposed to something distant that you read from arm's length. It really, you immerse and you go into it and you live it. So I'm looking forward to seeing what um, people will come up with and all the different creative ideas. We have to use our talents to serve the Abishnah.